Hi, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn session, Fascinating Pollination Facts from Around the World with Dr. Francisco Garcia. I'm Carly, I'm your host for today. Um, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am working today, the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. The people of the Eora Nation, their spirits and ancestors will always remain with our waterways and the land, our Mother Earth. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so as I said, we before we begin, we, we will be answering questions, but it will be at the end of the presentation. So you can either add your questions to the chat or unmute yourself at the end to ask Francisco yourself. Now, uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Dr. Francisco. Um, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you became so knowledgeable on the topic of pollination. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm originally from Mexico and back then I got really interested in bees and bumblebees and stingless bees. And I started reading a lot of books about social insects and I find fascinating the way they cooperate with each other for the well-being of the colony. And my interest dragged me to bees, but then I discovered all this amazing world of pollinators. And I was very surprised to know that other things can pollinate too, such as reptiles or lemurs or really cool things that we're gonna to learn today in the talk. And it's not just how fascinating they are, but how important this relationship is for us humans, for the fruits that we eat, but for plants in general, just ecosystems, it's just a vital relationship for the well being of ecosystems in general. Pollination okay. allows other plants to reproduce and to have fruits, and these fruits will develop seeds, and then these seeds will create a whole new plant later on. So, pollination is just the basis for all these very important relationships. Oh, it sounds so interesting. I can't wait to see your presentation. Are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. All right, let's okay. go. No worries. Uh, let me share my screen. Here we go. Can you see it? Yes. Great. Okay. So I decided to title it The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Um, why? Because pollination comes in all shapes and around in nature. It's just very interesting, this relationship. We're talking about thousands of plants out there, and each plant has their own characteristics and their own, they have evolved to attract different things, in this case, pollinators, right? What, what's a pollination syndrome? That's how is the plant being fertilized, by whom? So certain plants will have bee pollination syndromes and certain other plants will have lemur pollination syndrome. So it depends what pollination they want to attract, then this syndrome will be changing throughout the ecosystem for the plants. So that's me, I already introduced myself. I came originally from Mexico and I did my PhD at the University of Sydney working with stingless bees and I loved it. It was a great PhD. I, I really enjoyed working with the bees. I did a lot of field work. That's me, not in, in Australia, but in the Philippines. I got the chance to travel around a little bit. And then in the Philippines, we met local beekeepers and we were doing some local management, which was great. I always tried to learn from people all around the world and to learn more about the techniques that they are using in order to take care of the bees. Great. So I like to put this as a quick intro. Do you like these products? And I'm basing this in Australia. So I know that I personally didn't like coffee before I came to Australia. And now I'm the biggest fan. I cannot start my morning without a, a good coffee. Um, macadamia nuts, of course, that's another quite Australian big pride of product. And then mangoes, pineapples, coconuts. So all these things are pollinated, which is very important to know. If, we, if it was not because of pollinators, we would not have these amazing things. So our lives would change dramatically, right? We will not die, but it would be quite boring not to have coffee or macadamia nuts or just a whole array of fruits that are out there. So these things are the outcome of pollination. And it's very important to link what we drink, what we eat during the day, it might be linked to pollination not just the bees, but other kinds of things that are pollinating out there. And we will learn that today throughout the presentation. So quickly, what are we learning today? I wanna do divide this talk in two parts. One, the introduction part, which is the, 
talking about the flowers and what is pollination in general. And then I want to talk about some of the coolest syndromes out there, like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like, how are the plants attracting pollinators? One uh, option is giving rewards. Another one is through deception. And the last one is by doing traps, which is very, very interesting. Flowers, flowers, flowers. There's a lot of flowers out there. If you go out in the bush, it's just a highly competition market. Flowers are not there just to be decoration in our houses. They are actually actively doing something very important for the plants, which is helping them reproduce. Flowers, we could say that flowers are the genitals of the plants and that's how they can achieve reproduction. So in order to reproduce, you need to attract things to help you reproduce. Plants do not have a pair of legs and they cannot just go into a nightclub and meet someone. Plants are in things that uh, individuals that cannot move, they don't have this pair of legs to move around. So they need the help, the assistance of other things. And these will be the pollinators. I want to clarify that not all the plants are pollinated by animals. Some plants will be wind pollinated, such as a case for big important things that we eat, such as rice and wheat. However, most of the other fruits will be animal pollinated. And when you see a flower, all these characteristics will be around what is it trying to attract? It's a whole crazy world out there. You can see all these shapes, all these colors. So these are just some examples of the traits that the flowers will be uh, mixing, trying to show out there and trying to attract a pollinator. So just the size, right? If it's a big flower, it's not gonna attract small pollinators. If it's a big flower, it wants to be pollinated by big things. In this case, bats or rats or monkeys. Then time of the antithesis, when is the flower opening? Think about it. The flowers that open in the night will attract night creatures. The flowers that open in the early morning will attract early birds. And the flowers that open late in the evening will attract things that are active late in the evening. Second thing is the orientation. So also where the flower is orienting, if it's down, if it's up, if it's on the side, the scent, of course, some flowers will smell really good. Some others will have very funky odors. This is also related to who they are attracting to. They have rewards, which is very important, right? Some animals depend on food that comes from plants. Which are these rewards? Pollen and nectar, which are both produced by the flowers. Size and exposure. Again, if you have big flowers, big things, small flowers, very small things, such as insects. Pollen diversity. Look at this. When you think about pollen, and this I said it before in the other slide, it's one of the rewards that flowers, that flowers are giving. Pollen is not just yellow dust. It can come in all these colors and it's beautiful. Like it can be purple, pink, blue, green. So again, this is related to what they want to attract. Flowers are producing different types of pollen in order to get different things coming to them. So maybe certain pollen will have a very high protein content and some other pollen will have a less protein content. So this is gonna to relate to what's attracting. So just to understand a little bit more, I want to really quickly introduce flower anatomy. So these are just the basics, which is the sepals, which are here. I will try to draw here so you can see, I will annotate. So we have the sepals down in the bottom. Then we have the petals. Then we have two really big important structures, which are called the anther and the stigma. The anther is the one that produces the pollen. That is the male part of the flower. The stigma, it's a very sticky tube and that's where the pollen is deposited by pollinators. And that is the female part of the flower. So most flowers out there will have both male and female parts. Some flowers will be different in the way that some flowers will only have male parts and some others will only have female parts. But most of them will have both. And it's very important to understand this in order to understand pollination. So the anthers are producing the pollen and the stigma is just a sticky tube that will get the pollen and it will fertilize the eggs that are inside. Next one. Mm, let me, 
Oh, I don't know why I cannot. Sorry, it's like computer is bogging. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know why I cannot I cannot change my slide. Let me see. Um could you please stop screen sharing? I think my screen sharing is bogging pollination. So pollination is moving pollen from the anthers to the stigma of another flower. That's pollination. Once you do this, then the flower is gonna fertilize and then you'll get a fruit, which is the, uh, the main outcome of pollination. So we have three main things that we need to take into account, which is uh, number one, the anthers with pollen. Number three, the stigma, which is the female carp. And number two, the vector, which is gonna move this pollen to the stigma. This can be the wind, this can be the water, but most of the times it's gonna be an animal and most of the times it's gonna be a bee. Good. There are a lot of types of pollination. So just in a nutshell, we have self-pollination, which is when the same flower fertilizes uh, itself. It means that the pollen from the same flower goes to the stigma of the same flower and then you have a fruit. Another type is the, is the bee, which is a flower from the same plant, fertilizes another flower from the same plant. But then we have one which is very, very important, which is called a cross-pollination, which is a flower from one plant fertilizes the flower from another plant individual. Cross-pollination is very important because it's allowing this gene diversity. So you get really good outcomes when it comes to the fruits. There's a lot of differences in this. So it's very important to understand that when you see something on a flower, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's pollinating it. We need to be clear with this. So we have visitation. That blue banded bee is showing us visitation. The blue banded bee is visiting the flower, taking food from it, but it's not touching the anthers. It's not getting any pollen. That is not pollination. Then we have the middle one, which is very interesting, called accidental pollination. That's the ladybug. Most ladybugs are actually carnivore, so they do not eat nectar or pollen. However, they eat aphids. And we know that aphids attack plants and they live around flowers. So when the caterpillar is eating these aphids, it might accidentally walk around the flower, bath herself in pollen, walk into another flower and pollinate the, fl the flower. The final type is active pollination. So this is when the bees are actively flying between flowers to get food from the flowers. And that is the active case of pollination, which is the one that we will be focusing today's talk. The big, if you think about pollinators, I want you to remind the big five bees, I like to call them. So we have bees, of course, then we have birds, we have butterflies, we have bats, and we have beetles. There are heaps still more out there, but these are just the big five bees to, for us to start getting, wrapping our head around pollinators. These big five all go to flowers to get food. Bats will get nectar and pollen, same with beetles, butterflies, birds, and bees. However, there's a lot of there, and we still have this pollinator bias. If I tell you name one pollinator, I'm pretty sure you will name the honeybees, because that's even me, I name the honeybees. We, that's the main pollinator bias, I like to call it in the whole world mindset. We keep talking about honeybees as the main pollinator, but hey, it's time to start talking about the rest. There's a lot of cool things out there pollinating too. So that is one of my favorites, and I'm putting it there on the, on the right side. Look at that one. I call them the forgotten pollinators, the black and white rough lemur, how beautiful this thing is. This creature lives in Madagascar and it's pollinating palm trees there. How cool is that one? It's not a very common pollinator that we would name, but it is a pollinator. And same with hummingbirds, for example, or the monarch butterflies. So it's time to start talking about the rest of the pollinators out there. Good. Now I want to start talking about this crazy um, syndromes that we, we find in nature. I want to show you some cases of pollination that I find quite interesting. So the first one is going to be the rewards. What's the reward? So this is when a, an animal goes to a flower in order to get something out of it. There's some kind of payment related to it. What's the payment? It's going to be either a scent, which is like a, a perfume that the bee can get around herself, or food which is pollen and nectar, as we know. So in this case, the insect will be pollinating the flower, but the flower is also paying back. It's a very nice, uh, it's giving equality to both sides of the equation. So both are getting some kind of payment out of this. 
So these are the this is one of the most common pollination syndromes, which is the one where you get a reward from the flower. And these are some examples for you to, to understand. So these are just some of them, which is that butterfly is with its long proboscis, we call it, that big tongue, it's absorbing that nectar from the flower. While doing that, it's that proboscis or tongue part of the butterfly is gonna get a lot of pollen. When the butterfly flies into another flower, it's gonna leave this pollen behind in the stigma and then you'll get pollination. The same happens with the hummingbird. When it sticks its long beak in one of the flowers, it gets some pollen around it, and then it's gonna also pollinate. And then we have that bee, as we most of us know. I'm not putting honeybees because I don't want you to, to be biased towards them. But then this solitary bee, it's also visiting the flowers to get that pollen and nectar, which is so important. Good. Then, of course, social pollinators are very important out there. Why? Because social pollinators such as the social bees, like honeybees and stingless bees, they live in these colonies of thousands of individuals and they, are, they don't get to be picky about the food that they like. That's why we call them the generalists. They need to visit most flowers out there in order to bring food for their sisters. However, when it comes to solitary bees and other types of bees and animals, then they can get to be picky and start looking for certain flower traits. Just for you to have an idea, this, I'm not gonna read all this list for you, but these are just the things that are pollinated by honeybees. So it's a lot. These two images are showing you a supermarket. If you enter, if honeybees were pollinating things, which is a normal, uh, the normal situation where we enter the supermarket. And then the image on the right is showing you what would happen if honeybees did not pollinate any of the crops that they normally pollinate. So it would be quite a boring supermarket. And yes, the answer is, Honeybees are very important. They do pollinate a lot of things out there, but there's a big but. We keep talking about them. And this is the same thing that I said at the beginning. It's just biased towards this only type of pollinator. And there's a lot out there. Even the honeybee there is asking, where is everyone else? We need to start talking about other pollinators. And I, I wanna now walk you through some other pollinators that are more efficient than honeybees when it comes to producing the crop. Look at this, this is just bee diversity. And I, I study bees, so I am a little bit biased towards talking about bees as pollinators, but they are pretty cool. And they come in all these colors and shapes. Not just colors, now this is size. So now we can see the smallest bee compared to the biggest bee in the world. And then we have the honeybee just for giving us a little bit of a scale when it comes to the size. Great, let's go back to pollination. So I wanna quickly go through this topic called boss pollination. So in this case, this kind of pollination needs a lot of movement. So it needs a bee that goes into the flower and just makes a really big mess. Why? This flower can only release the pollen if it's really, if you can see me in the camera, the flower needs to be really, really like heavily moved in order to release this pollen. This is what I call the poor bearing anthers. So flowers such as a, Tomato flowers or eggplant flowers have this special type of a structure. So the pollen is not released that easily. It needs to be heavily moved by the bee or whoever is pollinating it in order to be released. Who is the main boss pollinator out there? The main hero, we call it the bumblebee. Bumblebees are excellent boss pollinators. They are very messy when it comes to visiting the flowers and they allow this pollen come out of the anthers when they land in it and when they are doing all these movements. I want to clarify that honeybees also visit these flowers, but they do not pollinate them. So that's very important to have in mind constantly. When we see something on a flower, doesn't necessarily mean that it's pollinating it. Okay, I told you that the main hero is a bumblebee, but what happens in Australia? We do not have bumblebees here. We do have them in Tasmania, but they have been introduced. And that's not an ideal case because they outcompete native species. We do have some really good candidates and we have solitary bees that can make up for this uh, gap. Solitary bees, some of them can be really good boss pollinators. So who are they? Blue banded bees, for example, teddy bear bees and carpenter bees are all found in Sydney, all found in different regions of Australia and they are really good boss pollinators. They are similar to honeybees in the way that they will land the flower on the flowers. They will move the anthers and they will release this pollen, allowing this pollination. 
what fruits, what things that we eat on a daily basis need bus pollination? Tomatoes. Who doesn't like tomatoes? It's like the basis for a lot of things. Tomato sauce and pizza and all these tomato soup. Like a lot of things come from tomatoes and that's bus pollinated. But also kiwis, blueberries, chilies and eggplant. That's very important to have in mind. Second case I want to talk really quick, it's apple pollination. So look at this nice fluffy bee. That's called Osmia cornuta. So next time you see an apple, maybe honeybees are not behind it. It's this type of bee, which is called a, an Osmia type of bee or Mason bee. These bees, look at the shape. So this is what I want to emphasize in the whole presentation. Pollinators have evolved to, to present a shape that is going to be very efficient when it comes to pollinating their crop. So with this very fluffiness that the bee has, maybe she's very much efficient by carrying the pollen around and around all these hairs and pollinating the apple orchards. Honeybees also pollinate apple orchards, but they are only 50% efficient compared to 98 efficiency when it comes to Osmia cornuta, which is very, very important. Next one is the, the flies. So flies, not many people think they're pollinators and they're extremely important pollinators. For example, mango pollination is mainly done by flies, which is very interesting. Who are these flies? The ones that I'm showing you are not the common house fly. These are called the hover flies and they mimic bees. And they, their diet may, mainly consists in flowers. So they get the pollen and the nectar from them. And at the same time, they pollinate these crops. Quickly, I wanna to touch on cacao also. So the chocolate that you maybe eat this week or this morning or whenever, also we should be thanking flies. So these are called the midgets, cacao midgets specifically. These are tiny, tiny little flies that visit, visit these tiny, tiny flowers that cacao produces, and they are pollinating this very important crop. So again, we should not forget about the flies when it comes to pollination. Honorable mentions I wanna to give to the bats, of course, tequila plants, for example, that's pollinated by the bats. Tequila comes from agave, which is these very nice plants that have very huge stems. The flowers are really big, white, and they open in the night, which is very interesting. So they're attracting these pollinators. Another honorable mention I wanna give, it's the biggest natural pollinator out there. So this is the lemur, the one that I was talking to you at the beginning. So this guy is impressive. It's in Madagascar. The way it's pollinating this palm, it's by opening these um, scales of the palm. Then he, you need to be very strong in order to pollinate this plant. Why? You can see on the image on the right, the flowers are in this scale thingy. So the lemur needs to open this with his bare hands. Then he can get access to the nectar. While doing that and drinking this nice juice, he gets a lot of pollen on the face. He goes into another flower, opening it, puts that pollen in the flower, and then he is able to pollinate, okay? Finally, I wanna give the name to their cold-blooded pollinators, which are super cool. This is in an island in Africa, and this is a type of gecko, and they also pollinate. So who would think that lizards can also pollinate? And he's an active pollinator, which means the gecko diet mainly consists of nectar. So this little guy is gonna be moving around, trying to get that nectar from the flower, and then he's gonna be able to pollinate the flower. Um, great, I will just like to, uh, let me see, just before we wrap up, I wanna show one last slide. Uh, let's see, good. There we go. Before we wrap up for questions, I wanna talk here about, pollinators are facing a lot of problems out there. So just for you to have in mind, I like to talk about the positive things all the time. I'm very positive, but I also need to address the negative part, which is most pollinators out there are facing problems. Why? These are the main problems, the pesticide. That's a big problem for insects. Habitat degradation, of course, that's happening all over the world. Chopping off the forest, it's taking down all this habitat, but it's important for animals not just pollinators, any, any animal or plant out there are, are facing this main problem. I think the lack of conservation, it's, it's the main problem. So by doing this kind of talks, it's great because we all get to know how cool they are, but how to protect them. And I think a really good tool to, to use is education. The more we can spread the word about how fascinating they are and how cool they are, the more we can protect them and do good things to, to, for them to be there. What's next for me? 
I did my PhD here. I'm now applying for grants to study pollinators in Madagascar. So fingers crossed, I will get them. I just wanted to let you know where will I be next, but I'm always uh, contacted by Zoom, so that's fine. And um, thank you so much for listening. I, I could talk about pollinators for the next two hours, but I know that we only have half an hour. Thank you so much for coming. Um,